We're joined by, uh, let's see, Dr. Sophie Van Hulen. She's a lecturer in the Department of Economics, and she specializes in um, international finance, econometrics, and primary commodities. And like a lot of our academics at SOAS, she has a background actually working in the field as well. So she's worked as a consultant for the German Federal Ministry of Finance, the African Development Bank, and the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Um, and we're also joined by one of our final year students, So Yoon. So she'll be available to answer any questions about what it's like to be a student, and she'll be available at the end to talk a little bit more about that. So if we are ready, I think I might hand over now to Dr. Hulin to talk about the economic impact of COVID-19, what GDP doesn't tell you. Over to Brilliant. you. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, I will share my screen. One second. Okay, here we are. As Sonia said, the economic, uh, the economic impact of COVID-19, and we will focus today on measuring this economic impact, um, leaning a little bit to GDP, which is probably the one measure that is most famous and uh, famously used in order to measure, well, how the economy is doing, basically. It's kind of like taking the temperature of the economy to see how well things are going. However, we will put a little bit of a critical perspective on GDP and see how well it actually does capture the economic and also the social impact of COVID-19. And the two things, of course, are being interlinked. So we have a little bit of a debate. Um, no need to introduce her. So Yun will join me. Um, and she's uh, our finalist students in the BA Economics and Politics. And towards the end of the session, she also has some time to introduce herself properly um, to you. So let's start the lecture. The objectives today, probably not in that precise order, but we will first cover um, what is GDP very briefly, because most of you will be familiar with that measure, but we have a little bit of a technical discussion here, then move into the economic impact uh, of COVID-19 as it's seen through the lens of GDP, then reflect on that measure and see what's actually excluded from that measure um, and is also counted as an economic and social impact of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. We then look at COVID-19 and two particular um, lenses, which is gender and inequality, um, and then again look at it through the lens of GDP and the critique of GDP, and then thinking about what alternative measures are there. That's a brief introduction, um, and hopefully finish with a little bit of a discussion as well, both of course about the economics uh, as department, but hopefully also about the content of this talk. So let me start. Um, these are three different headlines I actually picked from um, different news outlets just yesterday. So they're yesterday's headlines. And as you can see, so the left one is from the Financial Times, which titles UK economy shrinks by the most in 300 years. The uh, one in the middle is The Guardian, it says the UK economy hit by a record slump in 2020. And the one on the right is taken from the BBC, um, which tells you that the UK economy suffered a record annual slump in 2020. So all very similar. They talk about uh, the economy shrinking, um, a record slump of the economy. What they kind of uh, do mean by this is they report on a figure that has been announced by the Office for National Statistics, um, which uh, tells you that the GDP in the UK shrank by 9.9%, so almost double digits, 10% uh, figure. So while that is not obvious in the headlines and actually um, that we're actually talking about GDP only flags up in the subtitle of The Guardian, what these stories mean when they say the economy shrank is that GDP, so the gross domestic product has shrunk. Um, so that tells you how important GDP is also in evaluating um, the, how the economy does. Now, what is GDP? Uh, GDP in simple or, or kind of abstract terms is the total value of goods and services that is produced in an economy over a given time frame. Uh, often figures are being announced on a quarterly basis. They frequently be revised as, of course, measurement processes take time um, or they're being reported on an annual basis. There are three different ways uh, in which GDP can be measured, which is called either the expenditure, income or production method. Um, and they um, all by kind of the national accountancy standards, they all co should come up with exactly the same value. Um, often how GDP is being seen or being perceived, it's kind of um, a measure of the standard of living or well-being or the well-being of the economy as a whole. 
it's a very uh, it's a measure that is uh, being emphasized a lot and uh, seen as of great being of great importance. It's often um, in or reported in per capita terms, which then allows you to compare it across different countries because you're divided by the number of citizens uh, that are resident in that uh, economy. Um, so it gives you a way to compare between large economies and smaller economies. Um, if GDP increases, it's always seen as kind of a growth or improvement in the standard of living. If it decreases, um, especially if it falls by definition um, over two successive quarters, then this uh, is seen as a recession. So that's the definition of a recession. However, what we need to keep in mind, and that's just a footnote here, not something that we would focus on much, but something to keep in mind uh, nevertheless, is what goes in and what is outside of GDP. So what is being taken as being produced in an economy is as much a political decision as a statistical question. Um, it's not an objective measure at all. Um, it has been changed. So what goes in and what comes out has been changed over time, over history, a couple uh, a couple of times uh, has changed up. So for instance, famously, financial services have been excluded for a long time as part of GDP as the financial sector was seen as the unproductive sector. Um, but after a lot of lobbying from the financial sector industry, um, it has now it was now included as part of the measures of, of GDP. So as you can see, there's a lot of kind of uh, political decisions as much as statistical ones, um, what is measured as a productive element and what is measured as not a productive element. Now, this is a quick look at how GDP has evolved throughout the um, COVID crisis. This is um, taken uh, during the first lockdown um, and uh, looking in at the UK. And just to sh show you the kind of massive and almost unpre unprecedented impact COVID-19 had on the shrinking of the economy as um, various sectors were being shut down. And you see um, all the red elements um, are the parts where the economy has shrunk. And you can see um, the, the ones that kind of some of us might remember, some of you might be too young to remember um, uh, very vividly, but uh, the last kind of major shock we had was the global or great financial crisis um, in 2007, 2008. And now the, the shrinking of the economy over COVID-19 uh, um, has kind of um, exceeded that uh, value by five times. So it's a massive uh, drop in the production of the economy. Um, now, this is an exercise where I will ask you to use your chat function. So over to you, um, thinking about it as a measure of measuring the productive output of an economy, so what's being produced in the economy, what do you think are the elements that might affect your standard of living or your well-being that is not included in GDP? And for this, I'm asking you to use the chat function, um, either the one that only I can see, um, and so Yoon can say, see and Tanya can see, or also if you want to share it with everyone else, then of course use the one uh, where everyone can see. And uh, so Yoon, Tanya, I cannot, cannot see the set chat function at the moment. So maybe if you enable your microphones, you can just feed me the stuff that comes in. Um, I'll give you maybe a minute um, to think about the elements that might be excluded. Murphy, would you like me to be telling you as people write it or wait until the end? Yes, please do. Yeah. This may be uh, as it as it comes in, and uh, we take about I don't know a minute. So we've got um, a few things listen. coming in. We've got interest rates, education levels, healthcare, mm -hmm. sanitation, level of happiness, green space measure, voluntary babysitting, externalities, for example, pollution, um, secondhand mm -hmm. items. So, for example, eBay, uh, life expectancy, environmental concerns inequality, subsistence farming, lots of ideas coming in, <laughs> pensions. Amazing. Okay, I'm, com I'm completely blown away. I'm gonna, uh, let's close this now. So you guys are amazing. Yes, you're absolutely right. And you're going in exactly the direction I wanted you to go to. Um, and all of these things, um, yes, are excluded from GDP. Um, and of course are affecting your wellbeing and happiness. And, um, there is kind of, you will find everything that has been said as part of this kind of five point list. Um, so one of the things that is not reflected is the quality of goods and services. Um, then also activities that are not recorded and also activities that something that is secondhand, for instance, that is not being newly produced. 
Uh, then sustainability and environmental concerns, of course, externalities are not being accounted for um, in as part of GDP. So the quality of the air that we breathe is not part um, of GDP. Um, also, um, the kind of the, the idea of value. So only what is um, being transacted on a marketplace is accounted for in GDP. So something like volunteering, um, it's not being accounted for, it's not being counted in GDP, but of course it plays a huge role um, in how societies operate um, and also our, our well-being. Um, the other thing is distribution and inequality came through as well. Um, so who gains and who loses? So who's who's getting the gains from that growth in GDP and who, who doesn't? Of course, not everyone will be equally benefiting from that increase. Um, and all of these could we can probably have a full lecture on all of these different elements. We were focused in the context of COVID-19, we were focused on the last two. Um, so the production, that production only counts if it's transacted on a marketplace. So services that are not transacted on the marketplace are not counted. Um, and also the element of inequality and distribution. So the question who gains and who loses if GDP uh, increases or shrinks. And that we would see um, can be quite different, especially in the context of COVID-19. Um, so here and I, I um, in, uh, again, I'm inviting you to use the chat function again. I'm not asking you um, to, uh, to read it out this time. Um, I will just talk you through, but have a have a think about these four different examples and whether they might be part of GDP and or not. And given the answers that you have just provided me before, I, I think you know the answer to all four of them already. So I'm not um, asking you to do that exercise, uh, but yeah, mentally um, go through that with me together. So the first thing is a meal in a restaurant. A meal in a restaurant would be counted as GDP. However, if you would cook the same meal, not in a, um, at home, then only the part where you do your grocery shopping in the supermarket will be counting towards GDP, but your labored hours by cooking the meal at home will not be accounted for um, as part of GDP. Although, of course, you're producing the meal as the cook in the restaurant or the chef in the restaurant would also produce that same meal. Um, looking after your elderly relatives, for instance, is not counted um, as part of GDP. A child being looked after by a child minder could be counted towards GDP if the child minder is reimbursed voluntarily, so receives a wage income um, for um, the service of looking after that child. However, if that person is not reimbursed, um, then of course that's not being counted towards GDP. Working for no pay in Oxfam um, as part of volunteering, also not something that counts uh, towards GDP. So lots of elements um, or productive activities and services that we engage in, both on an everyday uh, basis, but also that make the fabric of what society is and what our economy is and how it operates, is not being accounted for um, as part of GDP. Now, why does this matter? Or why should we con be concerned about this? Um, one of the reasons is the power of GDP. So there's a huge emphasis of uh, the figure of GDP. We constantly hear about GDP as a yardstick of how well our economy does um, and how well our economy does in a global comparison. Um, but given that these elements are excluded um, and these elements are important in society, it does matter. So there's one particular critique which comes from the feminist economics uh, background, which comes with the argument or fundamentally is based on the argument that this is unfair, that some excluding some of these activities is fundamentally unfair. And why does it come from the feminist economics background? Well, because most of these activities which are unpaid work, uh, so-called unpaid work and not counted for as part of GDP are predominantly done by women. And uh, on the top right hand side, that figure that kind of gives you a breakdown um, of the activities or the average hours um, that both female and male members of a household um, spend on certain activities that are unpaid labor or unpaid work. Um, so in a way, the, the GDP puts value on certain activities while it takes value away from certain activities. And by doing that, GDP shapes what policy does focus on. So for instance, the automobile sector, of course, in, it has a lot, much larger share in GDP than the social care sector. So policy often focus much more on the, uh, the automobile sector rather than the social care sector, while from a societal point of view, maybe the social care sector should at least um, receive equal attention. 
Um, also, the value that uh, society or the value society perceives as being attached to certain activities um, is often linked to how we are being remunerated for this activity in the economy. And that is reflected then also implicitly in the uh, gender pay gap and um, also how much, for instance, someone uh, working as a social worker receives um, as compared to someone who's a financial trader. And the next figure does show you that quite, uh, quite strongly. So this is an interesting figure, which um, compares both uh, the pay gap in certain, um, certain um, uh, professions um, and the size of these little bubbles uh, give you uh, the uh, pay, so the, the median hourly pay that someone in that sector would receive. So the larger the circle is, um, the larger the pay um, that person would receive or that the pay uh, received in, in that particular sector. And you can see that um, there are, of course, huge disparities uh, or huge gender gaps in some sectors where there are quite small ones in others. And for instance, for the, the largest uh, uh, pay gap, which is in favor of female workers, is working in a, as a secretary for a company, while the largest pay gap in favor of uh, male workers in, is in metal making or, or, or uh, treating processes. So there it's almost like 50% uh, difference. However, we can see that in some of the sectors, like uh, being a director of a major organization, there's still a plus 20% uh, pay gap between male and female workers. So what one thing that we see here is that there is a huge disparity in wages received across sectors per se. The, these sectors which have a prominently more female workers than male workers are often the ones that receive a smaller pay than the ones that, uh, that have prominently more male workers, but that's of course not exclusively the case. And within these sectors which are highly paid and maybe have more male workers, there is also still um, Oft, or often and not always um, a pay gap that is in favor of the male worker. But often the, the, the disparity between on average, so if you look at the all, a full time job here, it's not only that within the same sector people are receiving unequal pay depending on their gender, but it's also that which sector you're working in often is differentiated by gender quite strongly. So all of this then kind of contributes to the overall uh, um, gender pay gap. Um, now, moving on another aspect, so our second aspect we wanted to focus on that is excluded from GDP is the idea of equality or distribution. So who, who benefits from that increase um, or suffers from that decrease of GDP? And especially if we think about GDP per capita, which is basically taking GDP as an average over the number of citizens in an economy. So there's this kind of famous uh, or kind of almost funny, but uh, also sad in a way, um, a story about uh, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon. Uh, Amazon. If he walks into a cafe, on average, everyone in this cafe is a billionaire. Of course, no one else in that cafe, although on average, they're now all billionaires, will actually benefit from this. And that shows you how misleading the GDP per capita can be. So if it's just a few number of people who have the largest share uh, of, of that GDP figure, but everyone else uh, has uh, received quite little, that means that the benefit of an increase in GDP also only accrues to very few. And that's something that we have seen actually over time since the 80s, that GDP, as GDP might rise, that increase or benefit um, is not shared equally and increasingly actually it shares it's shared unequally. And then the right hand side, this is exactly what this figure shows you, the share of income that is going to the uh, richest 1% households. And you can see that, that if in an, we were in a totally equal society, that share should always be 1%. So the richest 1% should get uh, the 1% one, 1 of, the, of the income. However, we see that over time, it's actually uh, gone up to 8% which means that there's a much larger weight um, on the high income households um, than on, on the small ones. So the, the other thing is that this, this pattern of inequality is not necessarily just differentiated by income per se, but it also highly intersected with both gender, race, disability, and also use. Um, so increasingly age, and that's something that's important, especially in the context of COVID-19. 
Now, having learned uh, these two different lenses which are, um, through which we can critique GDP as this being excluded, but of course clearly being important for the well-being uh, of the individual member of a society, um, as well as for the socioeconomic impact uh, of, um, of any economic activity or the, the, the state uh, of the economy. Um, let's focus on COVID-19 um, and what it does uh, to both the gender dimension and the inequality dimension um, and how this might not be reflected in the figures uh, that or the GDP figure. Now, let's start with um, that's kind of the perception of um, the impact of uh, COVID-19 at the beginning of the crisis. So that's now talking about maybe March. So when we were at the beginning of the first lockdown, um, we would news and uh, a lot of research was done on kind of the negative short term impact. There was talk about a V-shaped recovery, um, kind of some sectors clearly benefiting while others are being hard hit and particularly ne negatively impacted were non-food retail, service and transport industries. But there was also this kind of talk about we all in it together and COVID-19 being seen as the great leveler as of course disease doesn't uh, kind of differentiate between um, income uh, between wealth. But the thing is, it, it kind of does, and it does in a peculiar way. And we will, uh, we will look at this in particular. So also talk about work from home being normalized. So that's something that's probably not going to go away. Um, however, especially at the beginning, now increasingly more this is done actually, that there's little analysis of the socioeconomic inequalities that are exacerbated, exacerbated by COVID-19. So at the beginning, it was uh, that it surfaced that um, a lot of the inequalities kind of were, let's say, um, put into focus um, by COVID-19. But now we also understand that actually these inequalities have been exacerbated by COVID-19. So it's not only that they are that there's a light shown on these and they're more visible now, it's also that these inequalities have become more severe um, throughout the crisis, especially in some contexts. Now, next exercise for you. Um, Think about in which ways COVID-19 has had a socioeconomic impact that may not be captured by GDP. And also think about ways in how COVID-19 has shifted priorities. So what might have improved despite GDP being so dramatically reduced? Um, so although we have seen like almost like a 10% fall in GDP, maybe something um, has improved uh, socioeconomically uh, for you, for, 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 for society as a whole. Over to you, um, one minute again, anything you can think of. And Tanya, um, maybe you can feed me, um, feed me the, the input that we receive from our amazing- They're coming audience. in already. So I'm gonna start reading it off right now before I lose it. <laughs> so decrease in pollution. Uh, people are more focused on mental health in educational systems. Um, increased poverty. Medical innovation and investment has improved. So there's a few pros and cons, actually, I've noticed. Um, COVID-19 might lead to green and sustainable economy in the future. Uh, people have put more effort into building relationships to help their mental health. Um, poor mental health, removing workers from employment. Um, more focus on societal hygiene and sanitation. Uh, vaccine time requirements, building vaccine. Uh, ability to work from home. Technology has improved over this time. Improvement in air quality leading to fewer cases of asthma attacks. So quite a lot in there. Poor social skills for those born within COVID-19 times. Factories of businesses shutting down may lead to a decrease in pollution. And finally, increased inequalities between genders. So service sectors employing a proportionately more female. Um, they and community put to the top of the agenda. Oh, wow. So this has really inspired people. <laughs> Disclosure of business leading to higher unemployment students missing out on education, and collaboration between competitors, countries, pharmaceuticals. I, mean, I, I think okay, I can keep guys, going. You, still so boring it, but yeah, I'm you are amazing. Week. You're basically doing my job here. Um, so uh, exactly, I mean, a lot of, uh, all of this is absolutely correct. And this is exactly, again, the direction I want, uh, I want to go into. Um, so this is just snippets again um, from, from the news and kind of reflecting a little bit on the gender and also sustainability dimension of COVID-19. 
Um, so there has been kind of a lot of talk about uh, the normalization of a greater sharing of, um, of childcare, for instance, and ha um, working, well, housework, like working at, um, in, in, in the household, um, that there may be, might be a better understanding of, uh, or greater equality of this work being shared. Um, between female and male members of the household. However, on the, of course, uh, negative side, and quite sadly, domestic violence cases and instances of abuse have risen quite dramatically. And of course, that's also linked to a lot of the mental health issues that have been uh, highlighted in the responses that we got. Um, the environment is recovering as a result of the reduced car use and fewer flights and also shutting down um, of factories. Um, exactly right. So, of course, that's uh, that's a benefit that the, the air quality and a lot of you who who might be based in London will have uh, will have noticed that. I mean, I have noticed that definitely that once we were in lockdown, suddenly the air quality was quite different um, and it has increased your your quality of life from that perspective. Of course, in other elements, it has decreased, but it ha has made quite a difference. Um, and also it has kind of uh, initiated a lot of very, very important debates um, about the value of certain professions. Um, so we had our, um, for instance, care workers um, that were probably undervalued and also highly underpaid. And there are lots of calls for them probably being, being um, better paid. Um, so a lot of um, as also yeah the discussion on the BAM community that's something that we're gonna um, gonna move into as well um, that it has highlighted a lot of the inequalities um, that kind of were almost invisible in society but has have been there for a really long time um, and that has been now blatantly become blatantly visible and also to an extent that it can't be ignored um, by the mainstream and politicians any longer. So that's uh, that's quite important uh, contributions uh, because of that came out of that crisis. Now, of course, there are also um, uh, many downsides to it. So when we look at it from the distribution inequality issue, we can see that actually the wealth of uh, the richest has dramatically risen, while um, a lot of millions of people have been thrown into uh, devastating um, situations when it comes to, to income and, and uh, wage earnings. So people have lost their jobs. Um, and so that's, again, a few um, headlines um, that the, the wealth gap uh, is, of course, increasing. And that's increasing both because those who were at the low end uh, of, of wage earnings, um, or both the wealth side and the income side, um, are now of have many of them have lost their jobs, while those who before were at the high end um, are now becoming even richer as the stock market has uh, continued to, to increase. So the pandemic does hit the poorest the hardest and inequality rises. And also there's a huge race dimension um, in that inequality as well. Um, so inequality has risen between groups um, that are intersect with income, with race, with ethnicity, with gender. Um, and also, and that's an important element, health and especially um, the, the, the health, not only COVID-19, um, but also how healthy your body was before, um, does intersect with inequalities. Um, the global aspect was talked about, so a lot about um, how globally we need to support each other, different countries need to support each other, since it's a pandemic, we can only battle it um, jointly, but on the on the flip side, there's still a lot of fight about um, patterns of, uh, of vaccines um, that are being protected. So yeah, so it has kind of um, supported a collaboration, but at the same time, there's also a lot of interests that are being protected. So a lot of plus, a lot of, of, of minus um, things that kind of have come out of, of COVID-19. But one thing, it has definitely made these dynamics more visible, both the inequalities um, as well as kind of the, the gender dimensions when it comes to um, unpaid, uh, unpaid work since we're working from home. So I've collated or put on one slide um, things that we definitely know um, so, of course, the pandemic is ongoing. There's a lot of research that is being done at the moment about the economic and the social and health impact um, of the, the ongoing crisis. But a few things we know for sure already, given that uh, the data has been collected. 
Um, so what do we know um, about the different ways in which COVID-19 uh, has increased inequalities? What well, we know for sure is that lower paid workers are more represented in the sectors that have suspended activities. So those people who um, have been on the lower end of wage, earn of wage earnings, they're also more susceptible to losing their job entirely. And that's a shard that um, I haven't found that this for the UK, but it looks as I've seen the figures for the UK and it looks very similar. And um, this one is for the US and it divides on the x-axis into deciles, so 10% are parts. The sectors that are on average have the lowest uh, wages and um, on average the highest wages. So you can see that the, the sectors which have the 10% are in the 10% group of the lowest wages um, have a 33% 30, 30, 30, chance of being shut down. So these jobs being lost while the sectors that are on the highest 10% end have uh, about a 6% chance of being shut down. So much lower risk of uh, losing your job if you are an, a high wage earner than if you are uh, a low wage earner. The second thing is that I think minorities, young adults and women are much more likely to be in lower paid works. Um, again, I haven't found one on um, ethnic minorities, but I have found some data and on average, black workers earn 9% and Bangladeshi workers earn 20% less than the average white worker in Britain. Um, so that, there's a massive difference um, there. And the chart on, on the bottom right shows you the dimension by gender and age. And you can clearly see that, again, going back to the sectors where predominantly female workers work and where predominantly male workers work, and the female workers being more in the lower paid, on average, on the lower paid uh, sector side. And that clearly comes through in this figure as well, where, again, um, you can see that um, on the y-axis, again, is the share, so the percentage share of those who, sectors are being shut down and also a higher probability of uh, losing your job is predominantly um, affecting the younger uh, workers and also predominantly affecting female workers rather than male workers. So uh, a cross section of all these dimensions we have talked about before. Um, a higher share of low paid workers are also essential services, so essential workers, key workers, um, which are more likely to be exposed to COVID-19. Of course, that's not exclusively the case, but it is the case for, uh, on average. Um, and also, and this is quite uh, badly from um, the perspective of how do we contain the crisis, non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, obesity, um, heart disease, uh, are linked to higher that are linked to higher COVID death rates or um, that uh, um, that that the affected uh, patients that are badly affected by COVID nineteen to so the extent that they need hospitalisation are strongly associated with poverty. So the lower the income uh, level of your household, the higher the probability of these uh, a household suffering from or household members suffering from these non communicable diseases. Um, which make you more exposed to COVID-19. So those are the most vulnerable often to having a severe effect uh, due to or severe illness uh, due to COVID-19. Also the ones on average, which are the most exposed in society because these are the ones working um, as the low paid and essential service workers. Um, now, all of this is of course not reflected in GDP. So now moving back into kind of um, the idea of GDP and how, um, what kind of the 10% drop of GDP tells us and what it doesn't tell us. And all of these stories, how different uh, parts of the population are very differently affected by the crisis. So of course not visible and reflected in that figure. So what if we go beyond GDP? What are the alternatives? Do we have alternatives? And there indeed are, and there's a lot of uh, big parts of the economic, um, well, the ec economists basically are thinking quite uh, quite carefully about this. And it's not only economists, it's a lot of social scientists, political scientists, um, and also people working in natural science, um, collaborating and coming up with a measure that might more better reflect um, our well-being actually and the state of our economy and how well it serves um, increasing the well-being of a society. So some examples are just listed here, um, which is kind of the Happy Planet Index by the New Economic Foundation, the Legatum Prosperity Index, the Social Pro Progress Index. 
But there's also a lot of kind of different schools of thoughts. So you might have heard about the Donard economy and a lot of growing emphasis on social and ecological criteria that need to be um, considered as part of measuring or um, capturing the extent of, uh, of standard of living and well-being of a society um, rather than just the number of the, 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 the quantities that are being outputted. So um, in conclusion, GDP is still our main indicator of, and it's being used as kind of a proxy for standard of living and well-being, although increasingly being, um, being questioned. But we cannot um, overestimate the importance um, that is being put on GDP, especially from a policy focus. So no country um, wants to see its GDP shrinking. Um, there's almost a, uh, people, uh, countries being afraid um, of, of this of this happening and maybe that might be misguided um, and we need to look deeper into what is it what does it mean um, that an economy shrinks. Um, GDP is widely taken as a measure to assess the economic impact of COVID-19. However, as we have highlighted, there are various uh, issues with that. The two main ones we have discussed is the idea of value. So if we um, if we um, equal or put um, put on equal sign the um, the transaction um, value, so the price that is being um, the price tag that is being put on a particular service or a particular product with its value to society, then that might be really misguided because a lot of the things that make our society or um, keep our society together is not valued at all because it's not transacted on a marketplace or it's undervalued. Um, in terms of low paid jobs. And this is the feminist critique on GDP. But there's also um, a, an angle of inequality. GDP does say nothing about um, how the benefits of, or, or the, the pain of this reduction in, in GDP um, affects uh, different groups differently. And often what we see that an increase in, in GDP um, does affect, or, uh, very few might benefit uh, to a large extent from that, while a decrease in a quite different group will suffer um, than the ones that, that might, might benefit. And that's an important consideration if we want to measure the well-being of a society as a whole. Um, of course, now the, the above two concerns have especially been kind of highlighted um, the socioeconomic impact of uh, COVID-19, both in the UK and globally. So these two factors are quite important, especially in the context of COVID-19, as we have just seen. So there are alternatives, um, but big question to you, and hopefully this can guide the discussions uh, we, we have now, is will GDP be dethroned? Should it be? Should we think about an alternative measure to GDP that takes its place? Um, why should that be the case or why should that not be the case? So that's uh, these are our discussion points um, for just a minute. If um, you're interested in these type of debates, um, we have a very active, as a department, very active seminar series, which changes its title um, every academic year. Um, our title for or topic, overarching topic for this year is identifying inequalities in the, and the limitations of global capitalism. And there are lots of talks which are freely available. So you can, anyone can tune in, um, especially now that everything is online. We all learned uh, how to use uh, Zoom and uh, various other platforms. So these are streamed and they're freely available um, via either our Twitter account or our Facebook account um, or our website. So if you're interested in these kind of questions, um, you 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 very very welcome um, to join these debates where we're taking these things uh, these type of discussions uh, further, especially on the ecological side, which is something that came a bit short in the well in today's lecture. Um, so yeah, contact us uh, if you are interested in um, in either these topics or studying with us. Um, and thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation. I will now um, end this screen sharing so I can actually see what you're telling me. Brilliant. Um, any questions, debates? Um,
Sophie, we've only got about five minutes left where um, that was really an interesting and quite a lot of big questions asked, but I wanted to give our two student ambassadors a chance just to introduce themselves and to say a little bit about what it's like being a student. Yes, ambassador, please. If that's all right. So we've got Abba and Soyun. So Soyun, would you like to start and just say a little bit about being a student at SOAS and Abba, if you'd also like to share. Yes, sure. Thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Soyun Kim. I'm a final year student pursuing politics and economics at SOAS. I do, I do a lot of positions outside of non academics, as such as I'm part of the SOAS peer mentoring scheme, as well as the economic ambassador that I'm standing here right now, as well as I'm a part of the career service team as a careers ambassador. One thing that I would like to especially emphasize since Sophie did a brilliant job in setting a solid example of a high quality education that is provided at SOAS is that SOAS is a very supportive community. There are a lot of resources and hubs that you can reach out to that would make your uni life so much easier and so much better. And we have excellent career services. We got excellent education and we have a really fun communities with loads of societies and we are located at the heart of London, where you have tons and tons of opportunities for internships, for volunteering activities, if you're interested. Over to you, Abba. Hi, uh, um, I'm Abba. I'm uh, currently a first year student doing economics and politics. And yeah, like um, she was saying, like, it's such a nice community here. There's so many different societies. and like literally any society that you could think of. And there's just so many opportunities to, even though we're online, to be engaging with like uni life and like economics is such a good subject as well, because it's so like essential to just how society is. And, you know, it's, it, um, yeah, um, but yeah. That's great. Um, we've got, let's see, three, three minutes left. There was a, a question in the chat, which was, and there's been a lot of chat just about general reflections and questions. We've got a very engaged group of students on this or potential students on this um, session, which I'm very impressed with. But there was a question about, has COVID-19 affected or influenced economic policy in achieving its macroeconomic objectives? Sorry, say the first one again, my mic. So has COVID-19 affected or influenced economic policy in achieving its macroeconomic obje objectives? Mm, that, dep that depends on uh, what the macroeconomic objectives of policy are. I think it put a lot of very, very important topics on the top of the agenda that has been forgotten um, for a very, very long time. So there's definitely... Um, there's this kind of strange saying of uh, which can is exploited on all by all kind of political spectrums, which means never um, have a good crisis go to waste. Um, and that's definitely the case. So you see uh, all, the entire political spectrum now coming up and trying to put their their kind of priorities on the top of the agenda. But I think there's there are some points which now can no longer be denied or ignored because it's just in your face, it's just factually there. So how COVID-19 has affected different communities differently, no one can deny that. Um, I mean, there, I'm sure there are still people who are denying that, but um, I, I just say so. So no one who looks at the data and doesn't engage in conspiracy theories can deny that this is the case. And I think that's, that's, quite, uh, that's quite an important development. Now, from a macroeconomic perspective, um, the biggest challenge at the moment, of course, is debtedness and how do we deal with uh, sovereign debt? And that's an issue that will affect all countries across the globe, um, especially um, countries who are on the kind of middle income or low income countries who have less ability to source um, credit um, than other countries uh, who kind of are more on the high income level. Uh, but even high income countries uh, do need to rethink the way how sovereign debt is being structured. So that's definitely a challenge. Um, that doesn't mean that there's a lot of this saying of oh, future generations need to pay for this debt. That's not true. Um, so that whoever says that doesn't understand the issue of sovereign debt. So the, the debt at a national level is very different at household debt. So for one thing, a household cannot print its own money, um, which is a very 
very important, as you can, would all agree, probably very poor, uh, dif uh, important distinction between a household and, and a country. Um, so countries do have their, their own currency, which makes the whole way of how they're dealing with debt quite different um, from, from the household level. Um, and there's also a huge debate about, I mean, now that we know how much uh, that, that debt can, can be taken out in order to prioritize certain um, economic and political interests. So now maybe that money can be put to use uh, to, um, to facilitate other interests, such as climate, uh, uh, um, to, to navigate and mitigate climate change, for instance. Um, and probably that debate of like, mm, we don't have that money is now not as strong. That argument is not as strong um, as it was before since COVID-19 has shown that uh, the uh, taking out such an amount of debt is actually seems to be feasible. Mm -hmm. So that I think it's more of a, it has triggered so many so interesting debates and a social scientist and an economist, we will have decades to research on this and the massive output that's being generated by academics at the moment is breathtaking and students as well I mean if you're interested in what our students are doing look at our SOAS uh, blog there's so many brilliant contributions by SOAS economic students amazing on uh, all sorts of uh, COVID uh, related issues but also other hugely important uh, important issues just to get an idea what our students are interested in as well. Yeah, well, I, I think that I'll, I'll just wrap up and finish with some thoughts from my point of view. We were talking recently with the new director about all of the different subjects we teach at SOAS. And he asked, which subject do you think connects all of the subjects? And I said, it's got to be economics because economics runs through everything right now. And it's a very exciting time because economics ties in with politics, with development, with everything you look at, you could touch on it with economics and that point of view. So I think there's a lot to be discussed and covered. And there's a lot of questions. And if we were actually in a, a seminar, this discussion could go on, um, but hopefully this has given everyone a, a taste of what it's like to be a student um, at SOAS and the kinds of dialogue that happen. And you've met some of our students and some of our academics. So I really hope that you've enjoyed it. We will circulate the recording so you can see this afterwards. And we hope to see some of you at SOAS um, in September when we start the new year. So thank you all very much and thank you to our panelists and have a wonderful rest of the day.